fortunately regarding this. Uh, I don't want to be late now so that we can start our main lecture on time. I hope you hear me well. Uh, yep, loud and clear. Okay, I would like to request all participants to stay muted, please, unless you have a chance to speak. Uh, let me bring my slide uh, and share this to you. Uh, I hope this is better. Uh, we're supposed to have uh, our ambassador in the audience as well. We have received his uh, remarks as well. So I'd like to address your excellence ambassador, distinguished friends and well-wishers of the Britain Nepal Academic Council. Namaste and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Krishna Adhikari. I'm the chair of the Britain Nepal Academic Council. Today, I have the immense pleasure in welcoming you to this program to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the council. On the 3rd of May, 2000, the BNEC was formed in an August gathering of researchers, academics, and other well-wishers at SOAS London. SOAS is the birthplace of the BNEC and continues to be its home where we all, we regularly organize our annual Nepal lecture. Unfortunately, this year, the COVID-19 pandemic has made our lives very difficult. We are unable to meet physically and have had to opt for a virtual reception instead to welcome our friends and speakers. We are fortunate that all three of our founding officials, I hope uh, they have made to the audience, they register, Chair Professor Suresh Subidi, Secretary Professor David Gellner and Treasurer uh, Professor Michael Hutt are still very active in the council and I'm delighted to have their attendance today. We will hear later from Professor Subedi uh, on the background and experience during the early years of the BNAC. BNAC was formed to serve and support the scattered but substantial and still growing community of UK-based academics, students and researchers whose geographical focus is Nepal or its cultural extension throughout the world. Let me run through the outline of today's program. The major highlight for today is the annual lecture. In this first half an hour session, we will have some remarks from the founding chair, Professor Subedi, and our guest, the Nepali ambassador. Before switching to the annual lecture, we will be introducing this year's PhD dissertation prize winners and hear brief thoughts from one of them. I believe many people in the audience are fam familiar with the BNAC activities. However, I think it is relevant to review and highlight some of them today. First and foremost, the annual Nepal lecture is one of the oldest and the most important programs that we have. It began in 2002 and ever since it has been a vehicle to promote academic and scholarly links between Nepal and the UK. In order to nurture this idea, we have devised a system to deliver the annual Nepal lecture by Nepali and Europe-based speakers in alternate years. Today, we are presenting the 18th lecture in the series. These lectures have covered a broad range of subjects, including literature, democracy, public health, research, environment, development, and higher education. Bringing distinguished speakers from outside the UK would not have been possible without, without generous support from the individuals and firms who love and care the BNAC. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank them again. We have decided that it is now time to expand the scope of the lecture. And from 2021 onwards, we will also keep this forum open to the speakers who are best outside Europe. About a third of our speakers were women, but we acknowledge that we need to work more to bring about gender parity. One of our most liked programs is the Nepal Study Days, which are popular among students, researchers, and even established academics. 
The first study day was organized in 2005, and until 2009, our programs concentrated either in Oxford, SOAS, or UCL. We now rotate it to universities to reflect the growing number of people doing research in or on Nepal and growing interest to the program. The Nepal Study Day became Nepal Study Days from 2011 program organized in Cambridge. From 2018, the RAM program, we have been running parallel sessions in order to accommodate as many papers as possible. The papers presented in, in the study days come from diverse field of studies and have helped the BNAC to evolve as a multidisciplinary institution. However, unfortunately, we have not been able to accommodate enough papers from the field related to the hard sciences. Nonetheless, we see both the scope and potential to attract them in the future. Unfortunately, we had to cancel the program this year, but we have decided to organize it online next year to be coordinated by Dr. Tejendra Ferali of the Institute of Education, University College London. Please look out for calls for papers soon. In order to engage, recognize, and celebrate good research conducted by the student researchers, we initiated, initiated the BNAC PhD Dissertation Prize 2017. And to mark the 20th anniversary this year, we have offered two prizes. There has been very encouraging participation. We would like to further diversify the service and have decided to welcome applications from outside South Asia and Europe too. We will be soon advertising a new call. BNSC also functions as a civil society organization in expressing solidarity or sharing concerns through occasional statements on issues related to Nepal. Uh, sorry. Uh, to Nepal or the Nepali diaspora. Let me share with you an example. On 1st October 2016, we issued a statement expressing concerns on the CIA intervention to the social science Baha. We felt the CIA intervention was unfair and politically motivated. There was outpouring of solidarity and endorsement to our statement from academics and researchers related to Nepal from all over the world. The Baha knocked on the door of the Supreme Court and eventually the court's decision to clear the organization of all charges endorsed the faith and trust we put in the Baha. BNC organizes occasional lectures, seminars, roundtables, in addition to all of them. I would like to note as an example that we organize an important academic workshop to mark the bicentenary of the Britain-Nepal relations in 2016 and the proceedings of the program have been published as a special issue of the European Bulletin for Himalayan Research, guest edited by historian John, John Holton. I, I would also like to call, recall that our colleagues at BNSC, especially Professor Michael Hart, have played an important role in keeping the EBHR running, which currently is being looked after by European colleagues. We are proud that BNC members come from diverse, uh, the, uh, come from diverse fields with expertise and research useful for Nepal's policy process. In an effort to engage them constructively, constructively in policy dialogues, we initiated a venture with DFID in Nepal, though this has been interrupted by the current pandemic. We are proud to join forces with the Social Science Baha Center for Himalayan Studies CNRS the Association for Nepal and the Himalayan Studies, the Nepal Academic Network Japan in organizing the annual Kathmandu Conference on the Nepal and Himalaya. We have also initiated the Martin Chautari BNAC lecture series, uh, lecture series from 2019. I would like to encourage BNAC colleagues to take the opportunity of sharing their research uh, in this forum. BNSC Executive Committee is made of researchers and academics from various UK-based universities. We have tried to make a system as de democratic as possible in order to allow rotational representation and opportunities for newcomers. We conduct elections almost every year. We will be electing four members next year. We would like to welcome you 
to join and serve the council. For more information, please visit our website. We have produced a brochure. There are various ways to stay in communication and get engaged. Please consider taking out membership of BNAC, of which there are three types, life, ordinary, and associate. We have kept the fees reasonably low to encourage new members, including research students. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, uh, more importantly, subscribe to our mailing list to stay updated. Finally, I would like to remind you the fact that VNAC does not run any research projects itself. It is a very, sorry, it is a small voluntary organization. We do not have staff to work for us and we fully depend on voluntary support and of the members and well wishers who go a long way to keep the organization active and useful. Though what we have achieved is limited, we certainly can aspire to be bigger and better. And for this, we count on your ideas, love and support as ever. I would like to wish you all and request you to stay with us until the end of the program. Thank you. Let me stop sharing. And can I check if Professor Suresh will be the in? Yes. Okay. Suresh, sir, can you unmute, unmute? I have. Can you hear me Thank now? You. Thank you. Uh, Okay, I would like you to uh, make uh, a brief remarks as the founder chair of the Britain Nepal Academic Council. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all see me well? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Well, namaste and good afternoon to you all. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the current chairperson, Dr. Krishna Adhikari and his executive team of the BNAC for organizing this event to mark its 20th anniversary and for inviting me to say a few words on this occasion. I would like to congratulate all of you on the 20th anniversary of this organization and thank you for joining the BNAC and supporting its activities. I am delighted to see so many of you, friends, colleagues, and well-wishers of the BNAC. And I'm pleased that the BNAC has blossomed over the years, attracting scholars from a broad range of disciplines to its activities. When we established the BNAC at SOAS in May 2000, at the turn of the last century and the last millennium, a sizable number of scholars at British universities and research institutions were already researching a wide range of aspects of Nepal. But there was no common platform for us to come together and share our ideas. That is why Professor Michael Hart, Professor David Gellner, and I thought that it would be a good idea to have an intellectual platform in the UK on Nepal and decided to gather information about as many scholars in the UK as possible whose work focuses on Nepal and right away we identified 62 scholars. It was our millennium, it was our intellectual millennium project and it has turned out successful. We were encouraged and supported in our endeavors by the then Nepalese ambassador to the UK, the late Dr. Singh Bahadur Basnath. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. And I would like to take this opportunity to pay a tribute to him. He was a man of vision and action. He was known as the singing ambassador in London, as he himself used to play the violin beautifully and sing Nepali songs to entertain his guests at the embassy. To begin, we invited all 62 scholars to a meeting at SOAS, and 46 people attended this meeting, at which we decided to establish the BNAC. For our founding chairperson, I was going to propose 
Professor Michael Hart, but he beat me to it and proposed my name. I had no opportunity to decline, as everybody in the room clapped to endorse his proposal. After the proceedings of the day, we had organized with the help of the ambassador and the then director of SOAS, Sir Tim Lancaster, a cultural program in the Brunei Gallery, where the establishment of the BNAC was announced. The guest of honor was Rashtrakavi, the national poet of Nepal, late Madhav Gimire, who sadly passed away earlier this year. After the cultural program, we all were invited to a sumptuous Nepali dinner hosted by the ambassador at the embassy. I had the privilege to chair the BNAC for the first 10 years, during which we established an annual lecture program and an annual day conference. We also organized talk programs and seminars focused on thematic issues and on contemporary issues relating to Nepali politics, law, history, economy, culture, geography, biodiversity, demographics, and infrastructure. When I was appointed by the United Nations as its special rapporteur for human rights in Cambodia in 2019, I had to travel frequently to Cambodia. For this reason, I stepped down from the chairmanship of the council and we elected Professor Michael Hart of SOAS as the new chair. When he in turn became dean at SOAS, University of London, he wished to step down from the chairmanship of the council. And we elected Professor David Gellner of Oxford to lead the organization. Both of them provided a sterling service to the BNAC. And I would like to thank them very much on this occasion. They have contributed and given so much to the academic study of Nepal. Now we are fortunate to have Dr. Krishna Adhikari of Oxford at the helm of the BNAC. The BNAC has gone from strength to strength since its establishment. And I wish the BNAC every success in the future. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Suresh, sir. Uh, now I have also the pleasure of uh, presenting remarks from our uh, ambassador, uh, His Excellency, Dr. Durga Bahadur Subedi. I have got, uh, I've got his uh, remarks. Right. Sound is not clear. Okay, sorry, let me. It's not letting me. President of the Britain Nepal Academic Can Council, you hear? Dr. Krishna Adhikari, respected yes. founding president of the Thank BNSC, you. Professor Dr. Surya Shubedi, distinguished guests and delegates, ladies and gentlemen, namaskar and very good afternoon. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to participate in this special ceremony to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the Britain Nepal Academic Council. I would, at the outset, like to congratulate its founding president and present president and dignitaries of the BNSC on the auspicious occasion of the 20th anniversary and wish its long life and hope that it would continue to contribute to enhancing the academic relations and cooperation between Nepal and the United Kingdom in general, and in particular, in enhancing knowledge-based research and publication in the United Kingdom and Nepal. Nepal and the United Kingdom have been maintaining not only close, cordial, and comprehensive relationship, but also multi-dimensional and mutually rewarding relations, which have promoted and supported a strong, broad-based, and reliable partnership. 
we can look back on more than 204 years of diplomatic ties between our two friendly countries. Ever since the establishment of our official bilateral relationship, the ties have been close, friendly, and strong based on the continuous and generous development cooperation, continuous trade, cultural, and educational relations and cooperation. The increasing number of British and Nepalese organizations in the UK, as well as in Nepal, is testimony of the extensive and enhanced link between the peoples of our two friendly countries. I'm delighted to note that Nepalese diaspora, which is more than 100,000 in the United Kingdom, is active not only for promoting Nepalese language, culture, and custom, but also is contributing to the creation of a beautiful cultural mosaic of the United Kingdom. I'm pleased to see that the Nepalese people in the United Kingdom have already been an integral part of the mainstream British society and through their engagements in social, cultural, commercial, and academic sectors in the United Kingdom, they have brought our two cultures and countries closure. I wish to inform you all that the government of Nepal has established a multi-stakeholder forum in the name of Shagarmata Sambad, the Everest Dialogue, in line with Nepal's consistent policy of promoting good understanding and cooperation through dialogue, consensus building, and collaboration with our deep-rooted conviction and faith in the notions of common good and collective well-being of humanity. We were ready to host its first global episode with the theme of climate change, mountains, and the future of humanity in April this year, which was postponed because of the unprecedented situation posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. I wish to take this opportunity to request you all to support the Shagarmata Sambad and participate and contribute to its themes of global importance and urgency. I also wish to share a good news at this August gathering that the government of Nepal has established the Brain Gain Center at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Nepal with an aim of supporting the sustainable transformation of Nepalese society by facilitation meaningful connection between diaspora, Nepalese exports, and pertinent organization in Nepal. Taking this opportunity, I request and encourage the distinguished members of the Britain Nepal Academy Council to join the Brain Gain Center and to contribute to the endeavors of the government of Nepal for the sustainable development of the country. The Embassy of Nepal is also hosting a Nepal Development Conference with the interesting and insightful presentation of seven Nepalese scholars residing in the United Kingdom on Saturday, 7th of November. I take this opportunity to extend my cordial invitation to you all to join the conference. Having said these few words of greetings, goodwill and gratitude, I wish to once again offer my best wishes for a great success of the 20th anniversary ceremony of the BNSC. Long live Britain Nepal Academy Council. Long live Nepal Britain relations. I thank you all. Dhanneva. I'd like to thank. Uh, with these uh, remarks, we have a program to introduce uh, the winner of the BNAC Desertation Prize 2020. And I would like to invite my colleague, the Secretary General of BNAC, to kindly introduce the winners. Uh, Poonamji, are you there? Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Krishnaji. I have this greatest pleasure of introducing our winners of the BSDM Dissertation Prize. Um, this is fairly new um, uh, for BNAC, new initiative for BNAC. 
we used to provide one and this year to mark the 20th anniversary we have two um, um, PSG prize winners uh, the first one is Liana Cis and second one is Ivan um, I will try and pronounce the last name and Desino um, um, Bo and the other chapters were um, Liana chapter was called Care in Transition and um, Ivan's chapter was called No Culture of um, Our Own. May I now request um, both of you to turn on your camera and um, are you are you there? I hope they have been able to join. Yes, I'm here. Oh great. I'm here too. Um, so um, uh, Liana is um, completed her PhD from SOAS. Now she's working as an assistant professor at Durham University. Um, and um, Ivan is uh, completed his PhD from the London School of Economics, and now he is uh, an ESRC Research Fellow at LSE again. And the committee member uh, for a BNEC dissertation prize. And comprised um, Professor David Gelmer, um, Dr. Colin Bondari, Professor Edwin, and Savannah Lista. It was a very excellent, um, um, very challenging, I should say, task because we received a couple of very, very good submissions. And, um, and the prize committee decided on these two. So, as I said earlier, um, Liana, uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm not able to change the slide. But anyway, Liana is here. Hi, Liana. You're at um, Connections hey. the News of. And if you could just, um, um, just uh, show us what you received as a surprise gift. Sure. Well, it's a hot water bottle with my photo on it. <laughs> and it says DNA 2020. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you. you. It's an honor. And Alvin, Alvin, are you here? Yep. Hi, I'm here. I'm just opening this, which was amazing. You delivered this morning in person. Thanks, Stephanie. It's, oh, a scrabble about ontology. I'm very curious <laughs> on this one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for organizing this surprise gift talk with us. Yeah. PhD edition with extra O's for the ontology, in fact. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm now at the Department of uh, Methodology in, um, at LSE, and as I said, Liana is now at Durham. So congratulations to both of you for your new job, as well as for the prize. And because we are running out of time, so I'm going to hand it over to um, um, Chris Nazi again. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you, Poonamji, and uh, congratulations, Liana and Ape Ivan, once again, uh, uh, and the uh, uh, very big thank you, Stephanie, for arranging these surprise gifts, uh, even during these difficult times, uh, which is really appreciated. I think we'll just uh, uh, take another four minutes uh, before we enter to the lecture. I My apology, and I think we also having some problem to get some of the uh, uh, people who register. Uh, I sincerely apologize, uh, but we have uh, now live stream in VNC Facebook page. Uh, if you are, uh, I have just sent uh, emails to most of you. Please check the passport generated. I think not the uh, VNC lecture 20. Uh, further down, this, there is, I think, uh, personalized uh, pass passcodes. So please use that. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Liana as a young researcher, as well as the early career mm -hmm. researcher, to reflect on what does it mean the institution like BNAC uh, uh, for researcher, a young researcher like her. Please uh, try to finish it in four minutes. Uh, sure. Thank you. I think I can do it in, in two minutes to make you happy, Krishna Ji. <laughs> um, so yeah, Krishna asked me to just reflect briefly on some of the benefits that I see in being part of an organization like BNAC as an early career researcher. Um, 
And I would, I would say it's been invaluable. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful to be part of this community. Uh, two of the advantages that come to mind are, um, first of all, in terms of networking and feeling like I'm part of a community of scholars. Uh, I've met so many people through BNIC, both um, early career researchers like myself, like Premila and Kumud, who I think are probably out there somewhere, um, but also kind of more senior um, figures in the field and role models like Punamji. Um, so I'm incredibly, yeah, I feel incredibly grateful to kind of have been able to tap into this network um, so early in my career. The other advantage that I wanted to mention is uh, that it's being part of the organization has helped me to get outside of my kind of disciplinary silo. Um, so as a medical anthropologist, I tend to kind of focus exclusively on the health sector and all of my connections are, are in the mental health sector in Nepal. So I've found that my uh, thinking and my writing has been uh, enriched by um, hearing from colleagues and connecting with colleagues who work in politics and economics and gender studies. Um, so I've, I think I've also really benefited um, in that sense. And as a funny anecdote, I'm actually now starting an assistant professorship at a university that I visited for the first time for a BNAC Studies Day um, event a few years ago. So I think in terms of understanding um, where research on Nepal is going on in the UK and connecting with uh, senior faculty in those universities, um, being part of the, of the BNAC has been really helpful and important. So it's a huge honor. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. It's a special thanks to Stephanie for finding the perfect gift. Um, and, and yeah, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Liana, uh, for your wonderful remarks and congratulations uh, on the starting of new job uh, for both of you. And the all the people, you know, applicants who submitted wonderful uh, papers. Uh, and so, uh, of course, we couldn't uh, uh, provide pride to everyone. Now we enter into the second uh, part and the main part of the today's program. Uh, and we just the three minutes uh, behind, I think, which is not bad. I think I'm, I still feel not very good that the maybe there are people out there not being able to uh, come in. I have the recent. Uh, uh, emails uh, links again. Uh, today's 18th annual uh, Nepal lecture. Uh, we have got uh, my Professor Martin Gensley. I, I hope I, I pronounced it properly, but if not, uh, my apology. Uh, 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 I would like to request uh, Professor David Gellner, who knows uh, uh, Professor Martin better than I do, uh, to introduce today's uh, uh, speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Krishnaji. Uh, that, that, well, it's a, a, a huge, huge pleasure for me um, to, to introduce this year's annual lecturer, Martin Gensler from the University of Vienna. He's the head of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Documentation of Inner and South Asian Cultural History, where he directs a research team working on Himalayan, Nepali, and other topics. He's also the deputy head of the Department of South Asian Tibetan and Buddhist Studies. For six years, from 1987 to 1993, he was the representative of Heidelberg University in Kathmandu, the perfect perch from which to carry out his own research while also facilitating the research of other people. Now, Martin is an anthropologist very much after my own heart, that's to say an ethnographer who knows the languages and is not afraid of history or texts and is adept, in fact, far more adept than I ever was, and certainly than I am today, at incorporating them into his work. He's a, he's a properly trained linguistic anthropology with many impressive articles with titles such as Morphosyntactic Properties and Scope Behavior of Subordinate Clauses in Puma Kiranti. And to work on the Rai, of course, you need to be a superb linguist, as everybody who knows Nepal knows, Jati Rai Utikura. Um, his monographs, Origins and Migrations, Kinship Mythology and Ethnic Identity Among the Mewahang Rai, and Ancestral Voices, Oral Ritual Texts and the Social Context Among the Mewahang Rai in East Nepal, have established him as the foremost authority on the ritual and oral traditions of East Nepal, which are known variously as Mundum, Mudum, Mintum, Ridum, or Dum, as well as on their associated myths, rituals, and social practices, such as divination. 
in addition to all this, he's also spent, you know, he spent many years in South Asia and that's, that even included fieldwork in Banaras uh, in India on, on the very old, probably the oldest Nepali diaspora community, if indeed it can be called that. The list of courses that he has taught in Vienna is huge and impressive and demonstrates his great range and creativity. It seems that for 14 years, he's never once taken a break and he's almost never repeated himself. The courses include everything from poetic traditions of the Bhakti movement, cultural hybridity in the Himalayas, nationalism in colonial India, visual popular culture in South Asia, as well as the more expected, a sant tradition in Nepal, texts on the history of the Josmani and shamanistic forms of language in the Himalayas. In short, he's a hugely productive and creative anthropologist. What I haven't mentioned yet is that in addition to all this, he has followed and analyzed changing forms of ethnic identity in East Nepal in a series of important articles. Today, he's going to talk to us about the fascinating Satyahangma movement. I came across this movement um, when carrying out research on religion in, among the Nepali diaspora in the UK. Uh, I and Krishna and the other members of the team, we didn't study this movement in any depth, but I have to say one of the most magical days of that three-year project was the one when Balgopal Shrestha and I drove off to Swindon. Now Swindon, um, for those of you who are not English, uh, Swindon is not exactly the place that many people would characterize as magical. But anyway, we, um, we went to Coates Water Park and there we met up with a large number of followers of Satyahangma carrying out their rituals in public by a lakeside under a gazebo, all dressed in white, performing a fire sacrifice ritual. Uh, and reciting their Limbu language liturgy. It was amazing to see that happening in a, in a, on a, an English summer's day. Anyway, there can be no one better than Martin Gensler to explain to us what this relatively new and fascinating religious tradition is about. So Martin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, David, for this generous introduction. Um, Yes, and I also want to thank, uh, I hope everybody hears me. Is that okay? Uh, yep, yep, the, he, he will. Sound all right. Yes, and of course, uh, I'm very honored to have this opportunity to speak today and give an anniversary lecture. Um, so I want to thank uh, uh, Krishna Adhikari. Uh, Krishna Ji, thanks a lot for preparing everything. And uh, yes, uh, it's really a special occasion for me to speak about this uh, topic here on, uh, yeah, on this occasion. I was hoping to do it, of course, in London, uh, where I was hoping to have an opportunity to have chats with uh, various people, uh, possibly also followers of the Satyangma movement, but perhaps we can have an interesting discussion and I hope and I'm quite sure we will have an interesting discussion after my talk. So first of all, uh, let me uh, upload my, uh, my screen, uh, my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, I think now you should see my uh, slide, my first slide, is that okay? Yes. Okay. So um, my lecture today uh, deals with an extraordinary saintly leader who was once a very powerful and influential figure in Nepal, much respected among the Kiranti and dreaded by the Rana state for his, uh, in quotation marks, seditious activities. After his death, however, in 1949, he almost fell into oblivion. Uh, yet today he is remembered as the founder of the so-called Satyahangma religion or Dharma, uh, Satya Hangma can be translated as the Queen of Truth, um, and his birthday is celebrated widely now uh, in eastern Nepal and uh, also the Kathmandu Valley and uh, even beyond. Among the Kirati, his memory is still very much alive, and in recent times he has uh, become a kind of national hero, one could say. Uh, yet there is still a certain vagueness about, his, his, about the historical person of Bhagunanda um, and uh, more specifically about his legacy. And that's uh, what I will be speaking about uh, today. Uh, let's see, uh, you want to... Ah, yes, okay. So, uh, Bhagunanda, that is his religious name, was born in 1885 in a small Limbu village in eastern Nepal 
as Nardoj Linden, and he grew up in a poor family. He eventually left to join the British Army and uh, even fought in the First World War uh, in Italy. But he eventually became a spiritual leader who preached a reformed religion among his Kirat brethren. Uh, he exhorted them to lead a pure and truthful satya life, giving up eating meat and drinking alcohol. And uh, he also spread education through the propagation of the uh, so-called Sri, Sri Janga or Kirati script. When he died in 1949, the Mahaguru, as he is also called now, uh, left behind a small group of disciples, uh, but his religious movement of a Satyahangma Dharma almost seemed to disappear. Only it was in the 1970s that it was revived with the appearance of a person who uh, was uh, revered as his successor, uh, the, some say the guru's reincarnation, uh, the so-called Dharma Guru Atmananda Linden, who was born in 1954 and is now uh, an important figure. I will talk about him also uh, later. So in spite of this great popularity, uh, both in Nepal and partly India in the 1930s and 40s, that was the time when he was active, uh, Pagunanda today is relatively little known outside the country and only vaguely outside the Kirati community. Uh, shortly after his death, the Rana autocracy ended um, and Nepal in the 1950s opened up to the outside world. And it seemed that the in the first decades of, of post Rana Nepal, the Guru's teachings had only little impact. At a time of new liberties uh, in terms of politics, political parties, mobilities, also consumptions, the ascetic ethos of abstinence was apparently not so very attractive among the Kirat community. And in the villages, blood sacrifice and beer offerings uh, for the ancestors continued rather unabated. And at the time of uh, Panchayat nationalism, uh, an ethnic movement, uh, that's how I see it, uh, like the Satyahangma movement, was seen uh, with uh, some suspicion. Uh, the new dharma remained uh, rather marginal. It is perhaps due to this that scholars so far have shown relatively little interest in the study of the movement. Uh, but the lack uh, of knowledge is also partly due to the fact that there are relatively few historical documents uh, which we have a testimony as testimonies of his activities. And actually one of, there's only uh, one well-known photograph and that's why I show you this slide uh, in the center. You have uh, the original photograph, uh, which, uh, which has been endlessly reproduced nowadays uh, and photoshopped in various ways, as you will see in the course of my lecture also in other forms. Uh, this is uh, one photograph uh, and seems almost the only one, but there's a second one, which I come to later. But it shows that uh, even though he was so active and, uh, and, widespreadly, uh, and widespread in his activities uh, in the 30s and 40s, uh, not many traces are left, but there are other traces like in his texts, and I'll come to that later on. Uh, I should mention that one of the few book length studies which have so or books which have been published on Pagunanda so far uh, is by Bairagi Kaila, uh, a book uh, with the title Mahaguru Pagunanda Ko Upadesh Haru Satya Hangma Pantka Bhajan Mala. Uh, so uh, this was published in 1990, but uh, since then there is, of course there are many articles which have been published in Nepali, but otherwise relatively little scholarly uh, studies have been done. Now, uh, the memory of Fagunanda is now more recently very much uh, alive in contemporary Nepal, uh, not only among his followers. And uh, this, I think, has to do with the fact that uh, in 2009, Fagunanda was included uh, in the list of the uh, so-called national luminaries, the Rashtriya Vibhutis of Nepal. I, I just uh, show here the list uh, of other persons, which are a kind of uh, rather mixed list of uh, illustrious figures. 
uh, as you see, beginning with K King Janak and uh, Sita, uh, Lord Buddha, and uh, otherwise a lot of uh, famous kings. Uh, but uh, yeah, the last inclusion of on this in this list is the Mahaguru Pagunanda, which uh, happened in 2009 with the approval of the uh, Nepal government. So since then, in particular, uh, the, uh, the figure of Agunanda is more widely known. Uh, he has become a kind of, I would say, almost an ethnic culture hero, uh, founding figure of the, especially the modern minded Kirati community. And uh, the national significance here comes out most visibly in this celebration of the birthday on uh, Kartik 25 uh, in November, which is happening pretty soon, um, which is a very important uh, occasion uh, for the Kiranti community as a whole, but especially for the Satyangma followers. Um, I show another slide here, uh, which dates back to the year 2000, uh, to show that uh, there was already a push to popularize uh, Pagunanda in, in the year 2000. There was a great uh, uh, meeting uh, in the Virenta International Convention Center. Um, and uh, here also you see, again, the image of Fagunanda, but also the official successor, Atmananda Linden. Yes, well, the major question I want to pursue in my lecture today is the following. How is Fagunanda remembered more than 70 years after his demise? Uh, what, is, what kind of image uh, is retained in, uh, of this exceptional person and holy man? who gathered uh, a large and an increasingly large following. And which ideas does he stand for today? Uh, which forces are behind this construction of a memory? That's uh, another question. In other words, who is in control of this legacy, which keeps on changing apparently? In order to answer these questions more specifically, I will focus on rituals performed by the Satyangma community. Uh, what I want to show here is that Fagunanda and his ideas are commemorated above all in ritual performances, worshiping practices, textual recitations, but also in the construction and use of objects, uh, images, architecture, especially the temples, the so-called manghim, and memorials. After all, Fagunanda has fundamentally transformed the traditional religion of the mundum which uh, includes in the traditional sense, uh, uh, animal sacrifice, usually pig and, uh, ch uh, chicken, pigs and sheep, and the offerings uh, of home brewed beer, as well as uh, rakshi. So rejecting these crucial parts of the mundum ritual tradition, what is it that remains? Is it still the mundum as it is claimed, or is it just a kind of Hinduized versions as uh, some uh, criticize. I mean, this is a kind of more general question. I won't really go too much into that, but that's something which is kept uh, in the background. Uh, following Paul Connerton uh, in his book, How Societies Remember, communities can be seen as reenacting a narrative through repeated ritual action. Rituals contribute significantly to a social and cultural memory, not only by transmitting ideas and knowledge, but also by the, by the maintenance of an embodied form of memory. So by taking a closer look at the rituals, I hope to understand how the spirit of Fagunanda, so to say, is kept alive. As it turns out, there is not only one version of the spirit, but there are several competing views. And this leads me to a broader sociological question, uh, somewhat uh, more Weberian in scope than the uh, Durkheimian approach of Connerton. Pagunanda can be seen as a typical figure of charismatic leadership, I would say, a religious reformer who tried to bring about not only a sanitized, even modernized religion, but also initiated a process of rationalization and social harmony through his uh, personal uh, influence. In Nepal, 
where the weight of tradition and clearly defined social roles often overlay the prominence of individual charisma, such, le such leadership, I would say, is unique. One of the few examples which comes uh, to my mind is perhaps Lakantapa, the rebel king among the Magar, but uh, there are not that many, I think, but uh, perhaps we can discuss this later. Pagunanda appears almost like a revolutionary figure, a kind of game changer, uh, which had, uh, who had a significant political impact during his time. He brought about long lasting change by initiating a new lifestyle of living, uh, a new style of living and eventually canonized tradition, which is still in the making. In fact, his influence has also left traces in India, in particular uh, in Sikkim, and in Darjeeling. So I should uh, mention that this uh, work uh, I'm doing right here, uh, I'm presenting here, is uh, part of an ongoing research project, uh, which I'm doing, uh, funded by the Austrian Research, uh, by the Austrian Science Fund, a project called Transborder Religion, with my colleague, uh, Melanie van den Helsten, who's running this project. I mean, we're working together on this. So this is uh, still in process, so to say. So my lecture will proceed as follows. Um, I will first look at everyday rituals as commonly practiced by followers of the Satyangma religion. Uh, this will include a description of shrines, altars, temples, and so on. I will take a closer look at some typical ritual sites. Uh, in particular, one uh, shrine in the Kathmandu Valley and another one in Fidim, uh, in order to understand the structures of uh, sacred space, including a more modern, uh, including the more modern uh, phenomenon of statues, um, which we have already seen on the poster announced. Um, th this is very important, the statues and memorials. Then in my second part, I will focus on the textual tradition. Um, books uh, are, in very, are a very important part of the Satyahangma religion. However, there is practically no, re no writing by the Mahaguru, by Fagunanda himself. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a rich written tradition. Manuscripts have been produced by his disciples. So I will come and, and then my third part uh, of the lecture focuses on the Fagunanda Janma Jayanti, the birthday celebrations as I experienced them in Fidim uh, in uh, November 2018. It was just at that time, by the way, that I was uh, receiving the invitation to hold this lecture. So this is why also this sprang to my mind that this is something to talk about. And uh, I should also mention, I was accompanied at that time by my friend and colleague, Novel Kisho Rai, uh, who I hope is also joining uh, this lecture. He was planning to. So um, on the eve of this birthday, uh, there is a big uh, home sacrifice, fire sacrifice on, on the Sumhatlung Ridge. Um, which is an important part of the ritual. And then there's a main public event um, celebrating uh, the birthday uh, um, occasion on the main day, uh, on the, which was the 11th of November, where the Dharma Guru Atmananda joined, came from Larumba and uh, addressed the audience on the sports ground of Fidim. Uh, so this is uh, my program, and uh, I will now start with the first part, the everyday rituals. Now, um, ordinary followers of Fagunanda usually have a small shrine at home where simple daily rituals are celebrated once uh, in the morning and once in the evening. For example, the shrine of one Satyahangma, one Satyahangma follower in Kursong in Darjeeling looked like this uh, in this image. Uh, it contains only a small lamp, bhakti, uh, which is continuously burning with offerings of fruit presented to mangma, uh, just a general term for Devi. So it's, it's a rather simple uh, shrine, a similar shrine is inside the house. But uh, this just to show you the everyday part of the rituals, uh, but mostly the rituals of the Satyarma community take place in temples. And uh, this I will, this image uh, I show you here 
is taken at the rim of the Kathmandu Valley, a uh, shrine near the village of Sangadevi in uh, near Lubu, um, which is, uh, as far as I know, still the only uh, shrine of the Atmananda line. There is also the Hatiban shrine uh, for Kiranti generally, but I will focus here on the Satyahangma tradition only. Uh, what is um, seen here are basically two temple buildings, an old one and a new one. The, in the front, you see the old one, which has been renewed by a more uh, modern one on the right side. And uh, the second uh, functional building is in the center, an open uh, wall-less uh, construction for the fire offerings. So this is a Mang him, as it's called. Mang means uh, divinity in Kiranti, most Kiranti languages, and him uh, means house. So it's just a simple term. But but this is a tradition which actually was initiated by Pagunanda. I have to stress there were no temples in East Nepal uh, or no Kiranti temples in East Nepal before Pagunanda. He was the one uh, who is uh, said to have founded the first six or seven temples. Nowadays, uh, you find uh, these temples all around. Almost every major village now has such a temple. So it's a rather new thing, but it has been spreading quite a bit in recent times. So he, he founded the first, the very first uh, temple was actually founded on the Silauti Dana, where he mainly stayed uh, in the um, Panchtar district. And uh, that was in the early 1920s. So there's basically a, a, this uh, three uh, part structure. You have the main temple um, you, and you have, which is called uh, Mujoklung. And then there's the fireplace and then there's the outside area. So let's first have a look at the inside of the temple. Uh, the uh, typical uh, inside of a Mang him looks like this. You have this pyramidal structure um, where offerings are presented. Um, usually it's eight levels, uh, sometimes uh, less, but uh, uh, it's an an what is important is an, it's an aniconic shrine. Um, and this is where off pure offerings like fruits, water, flowers, and so on are presented. The term mucho glung actually, uh, uh, According to the Limbo Nepali English Dictionary uh, uh, by Chem Jong and Kaila, uh, means something like creation, creator, uh, self manifest emerging God or Swayambu. So it's interesting you uh, could make your own comparisons. So the major divinity is thus worshipped in an abstract, formless uh, form, in a, as an abstract, formless divinity. And as, as I have argued elsewhere, um, this type of shrine, which was already used by Fagunanda uh, in his very first temples, appears to be inspired by the Josmani Sant tradition, uh, a Bhakti sect sectarian tradition, very influential in Eastern Nepal in the 20th and also nine, even uh, in the 19th century. It has been reported that Fagunanda actually was initiated into the Josmani Pant in 1913 in a small biography, which we have, um, by a guru in Burma, actually. Uh, and uh, this guru also gave him the name of Fagunanda. So that's uh, why he can still be considered as an initiate of this uh, tradition. And the Josmani today uh, use quite similar shrines, not the same, but also this abstract shrines because they are a Nirguna uh, tradition. Uh, that means a Bhakti tradition worshiping the formless divinity. So, uh, but interestingly, uh, you should note that uh, here you find many images of Fagunanda. So even though the divinity is not worshiped in, in any image-like form, uh, but uh, Fagunanda himself uh, becomes uh, increasingly important uh, as an object of worship in images. Uh, now, the second part, just to continue, this is the Kichoklung, the open uh, part of the shrine in Sankar Devi village in, in the Kathmandu Valley, which is used for these uh, home sacrifices, which I will talk about later. 
In fact, Michoklong, Kichoklong is a binomial term, a twin word, uh, which shows that these two parts are very closely uh, related. And uh, this, the fire sacrifices are usually done only on special occasions, whereas the temple itself is used uh, more regularly for daily worship, uh, like in this case, uh, where someone here reads from the Samjik Mundum. And uh, here I should point out there's also this tripartite shrine, which is also uh, widespread. Uh, this, this is a kind of shelf-like shrine where three divinities, uh, important limbo divinities are worshipped. It's Yuma, Himang, and Teba, which are worshipped in this form. Um, and uh, so you see uh, the aniconic uh, shrine is important, but also there is this second shrine, which you find in these temples. Now, just uh, to show that uh, actually these styles, this kind of temple is also still reproduced uh, in the present. This uh, was taken, these photos were taken in 2000. 18, just two years ago, when a very new temple was just installed. It was inaugurated in Fidim uh, during the uh, Janma Jayanti celebrations. So the, the structure is still very much the same. As you can see, the, uh, the Michoklung and the Kichoklung uh, just side by side. And then the uh, third section of the uh, sacred space is the out uh, is for the outside divinities. These are little uh, open shrines just outside the temple. Usually you have a trishul, but mainly it's the stone figures uh, which are here worshipped, like Pungsamang, Lajedangma, Teneba. These are all uh, smaller uh, limbu divinities which have to be actually um, addressed and worshipped before major rituals. Um, yeah, so it is striking that the images of Fagunanda are uh, generally uh, very prominent in these temples. Uh, and also you have uh, actually a lot of flags which are used, um, something apparently inspired by the Tibet tradition, I don't know, uh, but it's uh, something which has, uh, uh, which can be found in all these uh, temple areas. And uh, importantly, they contain the holy syllable, which is the syllable ot, uh, not om, uh, but in the Atmananda tradition, it's ot. I also come back uh, to this uh, part. But also here you see on this little flag, you see textual uh, sections in the Sri Janga script, and you see also images all reproduced from this one photograph, more or less uh, images of Bhagunanda. And uh, yes, so this is uh, the temple part. Now, uh, just a few words also on the uh, statues and memorials. Um, this I uh, would say as a more modern form of commemorating Pagunanda. Uh, more and more man, one encounters uh, such uh, uh, yeah, statues, uh, memorial statues of the Mahaguru, usually donated by wealthy individuals. Uh, to gain punya. Um, this can be found uh, inside of the temple areas, but also outside uh, at other prominent locations. So this is a photograph from um, one manghim, which is actually on the uh, compound on, on the Kshetra of Pashupatinath in the Kathmandu Valley, where I, I observed the uh, birthday celebrations in 2013. And there was just a newly um, uh, created statue being uh, here worshipped uh, on the day of the birthday celebrations or actually the day before. Um, now this is also one of the more recent uh, statues here in Labrekuti. I show this because Labrekuti is actually the temple which is uh, said to be the very first temple founded by Pagunanda himself. Of course, the statue is a rather recent uh, addition to that, but it shows that uh, this is something uh, which is now commonly added to these structures. So um, most uh, shrines, um, let's see, I have one more image. This is the one you saw on the poster. Um, this is uh, in Pidim, 
Um, and rather, I think it's probably one of the, the big, maybe the biggest Fagunanda statue. It seems they are getting bigger and bigger as time goes by, um, which was uh, inaugurated on that particular occasion. Um, so most of the memorials um, are near shrines and have become places of worship uh, themselves. These are there are also more secular kinds of memorials. Uh, for example, that's my last example. The, um, at the beginning of the so-called Pagunanda Rajmarg or Pagunanda Highway, which goes from Damak uh, through Larumba, the residence of Atmananda, uh, to Rake, uh, where it joins the major highway. Um, there also you find uh, such a statue of, of uh, Pagunanda. So you see that uh, nowadays the memory of the Mahaguru of Agunanda is uh, even inscribed in the road map of Nepal. Through the road, though the road is not in particularly good shape, uh, this is likely to say change soon. Maybe it has already changed because as the road goes through Larumba, uh, 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 Atmananda has already uh, announced that the road will soon be uh, improved. So this is the first part of my paper and uh, I will move on now to the second part where I look at the uh, textual part of the tradition and the textual ways of commemorating the Mahaguru. Uh, as it's clear from uh, this short sketch of everyday rituals, uh, the reading of sacred texts is a major feature of the Satyangma religious practice. Now, how did these texts come about, you might ask? Uh, and it's an important question indeed. Uh, basically, all these texts are seen as a special variant uh, of the ancestral mundum, which, uh, of course, is an oral tradition um, uh, widespread among all the different Kirati communities. It's the uh, foundation of their tradition. It's uh, it's an oral tradition, but it's of course also a ritual tradition. Um, but this one has been received uh, by the Mahaguru in his inspirations, inspira you know, kind of divine inspiration, or you might also say possession. Um, interestingly, though so the Mahaguru is known, uh, Bhagunanda is known as a keen disseminator of the Sri Janga script, and in this way he's, he has uh, a commonality with another important Limbu figure, Iman Singh Chemjong, who also spread uh, and um, propagated the use of the Sri Janga script. Um, still, though he did encourage, uh, so Bhagunanda did encourage children and adults, everyone to learn this script, he himself apparently has not left any written texts. There may be some singular cases, a few letters have been written in his name, but almost all texts uh, which are attributed to him are handwritten manuscripts in which some of his major disciples have noted down his sayings. And uh, I have here one copy of, of such a manuscript, uh, which is actually found in the uh, National Archives in Kathmandu, one of the few Kiranti books you find there. Uh, and this is, uh, we don't have a clear date and uh, authorship, uh, but it's clear from the text itself that it's written by one of one of the disciples. Um, and uh, it's just this kind of manuscript, which then has been put in book, book form, in book form later on. But uh, who are these disciples? There are basically two major ones. There are many, uh, lesser ones who have not uh, left uh, any written traces. Some, some have been uh, recorded, actually. There are some uh, booklets which report about the life stories of, of some of the disciples. But the main disciples are these two figures. One is Ranadoj Nimbang, uh, the elder one, but who died already in 1961. And uh, the younger one, Batrinanda Tumbapur, uh, uh, the, the elder one uh, is Batrinanda Tumbapo, uh, who died in 1970. And uh, uh, Batrinanda Tumbapo is uh, better known, and uh, that's why also the image uh, here is more detailed. Uh, there's only this photograph of Rana Doj, uh, who has 
been more prolific in uh, in uh, writing and uh, also um, yeah copying but mainly writing down notes uh, um, from the sayings of uh, the Mahaguru. Uh, but it's Badrinanda in particular who is well known because he is uh, the one who brought up more or less uh, Atmananda. He is the one who discovered Atmananda as a kind of uh, reincarnation and uh, possible successor already when he was a small child. And Badrinanda more or less uh, uh, brought him uh, to become this successor, which is largely acknowledged now today. Yeah, so uh, what is interesting uh, for the study of the, uh, or for the development of the textual tradition is that uh, there are basically, one could say two lines. Um, so the Badrinanda line is uh, what you could call the Atmananda line later on, which is the, the mundum, which he, uh, which is now the most uh, widely acknowledged. Uh, but the name, the Rana Dodge line, uh, can be seen as the more uh, traditional minded, uh, closer to the to the writings uh, of the Guru himself. Whereas the Atmananda uh, tradition has has been partly transformed. Uh, and also through the inspiration of Atmananda himself, the Ranadoj line uh, is closer to the spirit uh, of the Guru. But there's uh, one particular interesting sort of text, which gives a lively impression of the way of speaking um, and can perhaps be seen as the most authentic of the writings. These are collections of the divine speeches called Siva Khan uh, or in Nepali Amarbani. These are religious instructions or exhortations with a moral message, uh, but also a shamanic character, as they are spoken in a way of a medium channeling the spirit of the major divinity of Pagunanda, namely Tagera Ningwapu. This was the di major divinity he was worshipping. Um, and there's uh, one uh, interesting little booklet. Actually, there's also other collection, but the major collection is edited by Nayamhang Kailashi Nembang, also a Nembang, uh, the priest of the Silauti Manghim, uh, the well-known temple on the top of the Silauti Dada, where in 1931, there was this big political meeting of the Das Limbu. So this priest uh, has collected uh, uh, manuscripts. He himself has not written them down, but he has collected manuscripts where you can, uh, uh, read about the divination and uh, the kind of future tell the tellings of the future and moral uh, sermons of Bhagunanda in more or less uh, a rather, I would say, a rather authentic form. But the, the greater bulk of texts are actually ritual texts which are used for recitation orally, um, for daily rituals, for annual rituals, for life cycle rituals. Um, and these are uh, yeah, what make up the mundum as a kind of uh, big book used uh, by people in their religious uh, activities. Um, and as stated already, uh, these, there are basically two books nowadays. Um, you could say there's uh, the so-called Samsik mundum, um, which goes back uh, to the writings um, and, and uh, to, to the various manuscripts which we have inherited from these disciples, from the early disciples of, uh, of Pagunanda. Um, and, uh, the, and there's the Sanjik Mundum. So these are two terms which are uh, basically uh, meaning the same thing, Samjik and Samjik, both, both of these uh, terms mean something like the the philosophical or the spiritual mundum. Um, and uh, yes, uh, so the Samjik mundum is the version which is now found everywhere in this red book, which is published by Admananda. And this is uh, seen as the, uh, largely seen as the canonical version. So 
I just uh, show you this one image. Uh, this is the book which now is most widely used. Uh, it's uh, produced um, and uh, uh, also I think printed in Ilam. Um, and uh, it has uh, a very large circulation by now. It's found all in, basically in each household uh, of the Satyangma followers of the Atmananda line. But as I said, uh, there is also this other line uh, of the Chamchik Mundum, um, and uh, these uh, are not the same. And uh, I will not go into the details of what actually uh, are the theological or uh, other differences of these uh, of these two forms of Mundum, but uh, the, the difference comes out most clearly uh, that in the Samsig Mundum, the original uh, one, I would say, uh, the holy syllable Om is uh, generally used, and it seems that this is also what Bhagavananda himself apparently had been using, whereas the, the Samsig Mundum by uh, Atmananda Lingden uh, uses the holy syl syllable Ot. Um, and uh, so this is, of course, uh, you could say a minor difference, but it's something which clearly distinguishes these two lines of tradition from each other. Okay, so um, I will now come to my third session, uh, third section, and uh, this now deals with the Fagunanda Janma Jayanti celebrations in Fidim as I experienced them um, two years ago. Now, the most elaborate and most important ritual event in the Satyahangma tradition is, I think, the celebration of Fagunanda's birthday. This, I think, is, in itself is interesting, as in South Asian traditions, as you know, birthdays are usually not of very great uh, significance, uh, at least of ordinary humans, and it seems a relatively modern idea. Uh, thus, the celebration is a unique mixture of religious and secular rituals, as I experienced them here in Fidim and other places. It is performed in a spirit of worship and devotion, but it can uh, be celebrated uh, by anyone. It does not have to be uh, a follower or initiated person um, of the Satyangma religion. Anyone can do that. And this is indeed the case. At the same time, however, the event has acquired a kind of national significance and it, used, it is used by various players in order to push forward not only, not only religious, but also uh, certain political claims. Now, uh, the Satya Hangma uh, Jayanti, uh, the, the Fagunanda uh, Janma Jayanti is generally celebrated in two steps, as I already indicated, um, and this I have witnessed in, uh, in Fidim, uh, together with my friend and colleague novel Kisha Rai, um, who, uh, who joined me uh, and, and helped me in uh, observing these uh, celebrations. On the day before the birthday itself, on the 24th of uh, Kartik, there are religious offerings and recitations performed by Satyahangma priests, uh, whereas on the major day, the main focus is on a large public gathering with auspicious guests, and this has a more, I would say, secular character. So these uh, occasions were celebrated on November 10 and 11 in 2018. Um, so the major ritual action on, on the first day, on the preceding day of the birthday, took place on the ridge um, of the district capital of Kapanstar Pidim, uh, namely the uh, place called Sumjiri Sumhatlung. I should mention that Pidim um, is not only the district capital of Panchtar, by many it's also seen as the kind of inofficial capital of Limbuan, the Limbu region. Um, now this, uh, this old place on the ridge above Fidim uh, is a rather old Kiranti shrine. Uh, the name Sumjiri Sumhatlung refers to an old uh, fireplace. And as you know, 
uh, fireplaces, uh, as you might know, uh, are very, uh, hearth places in the center of the house are very important uh, ritual uh, areas for the Kiranti because uh, the fireplaces are seen as the seats of the ancestors. And uh, so apparently also this was originally something which was celebrated and, and used there. So the fire rituals must have been uh, in use quite for a long time. Now, uh, let me show you an image of this shrine, um, the major shrine of Sum Hatlung. Uh, so Sum means three and Hatlung means it refers to this fireplace, is in uh, a vault, but uh, um, above open compound, it has no roof. As you see, these are trees and there are many, many different uh, shrines and uh, divinities worshipped in this walled area. And if you come in, one of the first things you uh, uh, in encounter again is a statue here by Fagunanda, a stone figure, which on this uh, day was particularly, uh, of course, it was uh, um, yeah, uh, newly painted and uh, so a, a special object of, of worship. Uh, more recently, I should mention another statue of Pagunanda was built just outside of this uh, compound. Um, and this was actually inaugurated um, on that particular day. Outside uh, the inner walled compound of this uh, divine, uh, of the sacred area, um, there are other major divinities. Uh, there's uh, again this uh, uh, tripartite shrine for Yuma, Himang, and Teba. Uh, as well as other divinities of the Limbu. But the main ritual which takes place on that day um, is in the open temple structure outside the walled compound. And this is exclusive, exclusively used for fire offerings. Um, this, is, this ritual has been organized by the Sumhatlung Mandir Devastapan Samiti, you know, the Sumhatlung Temple Management Organization. Uh, which is not, uh, I should uh, stress, an institution linked directly to any Satya Hangma organization, but simply the trust running this uh, old temple. So it's not seen as a sectarian shrine, but it's seen as a general shrine of all Kiranti. Now the rituals, um, which you see here, this is now what uh, took place mainly on that day, large community, um, large number of people gathered. Mm -hmm. Um, and you see here the Seva Sabas in dressed in white uh, doing the fire offering and uh, above all giving different offerings. You see uh, these pure offerings of flowers and uh, food and bhattis and so on. Um, and this Seva Sabas are the, the ones who are uh, doing the recitations. They are the priests with special competence uh, to do that. Um, it's interesting, I, I actually only noticed later that uh, these performers uh, are wearing face masks, uh, something I, I just didn't notice uh, when I did uh, made these photographs. Uh, but, uh, and I was bit uh, startled because it, it was long before the COVID pandemic and uh, otherwise uh, people don't uh, have these face masks. And I asked recently uh, what was the reason behind. Uh, I was told that it's basically not to protect themselves. It's actually to protect the, the books, the sacred letters from the breath of the performers, maybe an interesting aspect of uh, wearing face masks. Um, now, this is uh, basically what's going on here, uh, also to show you that also on this shrine, images of Vagunanda uh, have, of course, been uh, presented. Um, and uh, you see the major activity is the reading from the uh, mundum texts, the mainly in use was the subject mundum. Here you see the main performer with a microphone reading from the so-called, one might call the red book, the Samjig mundum of the Atmananda line. Uh, but uh, I should say also, uh, there were also others, other variants of books. Uh, so I would not see it as an only a, a, a ritual 
performed by the Atmananda line, because uh, you could also see various other books, for example, handwritten copies uh, of books, uh, which seem to go back to the time when it was still difficult to print uh, these Mundum books in the Sri Janga script, uh, which only started in the 1990s, because before that, uh, it was very difficult uh, to print books in this particular script. Uh, so many of the performers were using such uh, handwritten copies for the ritual performance. So all in all, I would say the event was not sectarian. Um, it was rather inclusive. Anybody could uh, take part and join in. At the end, uh, the fire was lighted and everyone threw several fists uh, full of rice grains into the flames. Um, in fact, it was probably altogether many kilos of, uh, of, of paddy which were sacrificed in this way. My travel companion, who is not a follower of Atmananda, Riley told me that this is something which Jyotinanda, another uh, follower of Fagunanda um, and successor, one could say, who died uh, in the uh, early 1980s, would not have done this because this would have been seen um, as too wasteful of precious food. Now, let me come to my final uh, step of the ritual. This is now the main day of the celebrations on November 11. Uh, here is the entrance to the major event. Um, and the day of this celebration began with loud noises uh, in the sky. Um, two helicopters were trying to land. The unusual interruption of uh, these unusual interruptions of Fidim's rather unhurried rhythm were a harbinger of what was to come, uh, the visit of various prominent leaders. Uh, several high level uh, figures were expected, above all, Atmananda Lingden, the official successor of uh, Fagunanda, who came from Larumba and who paid in this year an extraordinary visit to Fidim. Otherwise, he usually celebrates the event uh, in Larumba itself, uh, but on that particular day, he did come to Fidim. And as chief guest, as you can read on the banner uh, in 2018, no one less than the Prime Minister of Nepal, KP Sharma Oli, was expected uh, to attend in the uh, sports ground. However, the uh, Prime Minister eventually could not come for health reasons, and instead it was the Deputy Prime Minister, Defence Minister Ishra Pokrel, who arrived from Kathmandu by helicopter. So there were two helicopters, one for Atmananda and one for the two politicians, or for the various politicians. So in a way one could say it was uh, a dual sovereignty here. Uh, you had the spiritual leadership of Atmananda and the temporal power of the uh, um, politicians which were here um, prominent. But let us look at the program shortly, step by step. Uh, the whole event consisted of various ceremonies which were partly religious and partly secular in character. The first scheduled ceremony was the inauguration of a, of a new Fagunanda statue. Uh, I already mentioned that earlier. Um, and uh, there were some problems uh, with this because the helicopters could not land on the Sumatlung Ridge because of too much dust and uh, all this uh, held things up. Uh, but um, eventually the events could take place as planned. And uh, then everything focused on the sports ground, uh, which you see here the entrance. And this is now the main days for the, for, for the major actress. Uh, you see the auspicious lamp uh, in front and the major throne in the center was the place for the leader Atmananda and uh, the others honorary guests were uh, placed to the right and left to him. Um, yes, yeah, so the guests, before the guests arrived, uh, you had as usual in this uh, kind of performances or, or fest festivities, you have folk dances of various communities, which was bridging the time until the auspicious guests arrived. Uh, but eventually, um, after long waiting, 
uh, they did arrive. First, it was Atmananda together with his wife, Pavitra Hangmalingen, and uh, also the politicians then uh, came and took their place being garlanded first, of course, as is the usual practice by malas and so on. Um, so it's in terms of seating, uh, I just want to stress there's a clear precedence that the, the spiritual leader was, of course, uh, prominently uh, placed. A special ceremony was uh, eventually done to unveil a new painting of the Mahaguru. Um, this is now because uh, a second photograph has been found or uh, uh, now been used as a, something to, to make copies. And uh, here uh, you see uh, in the lower picture that this uh, is now a, a painting which has been taken from the photograph, which I will also show you later. So this was a big event that now there's another photograph of the Mahaguru, which can be turned into a painting. It shows actually a, a meeting in, in the year of 1938 to Kumbhakarna, but uh, we'll see that later. Then the Dharma Guru, uh, eventually uh, Atmananda delivered his speech. Uh, I have to say that I don't find him a very a highly charismatic person. Um, well, in a positive sense, uh, he is rather reserved, soft-spoken while rhetorically uh, more unspectacular, but what he said was certainly nothing very new for the audience. Uh, he praised the deeds of his predecessor, Fagunanda, and spelled out the relevance of uh, the, his teaching for today. He stressed the need for nonviolence, the need for modesty, and especially the need for education. And perhaps with a more modernizing twist, he also stressed the, the, the need for gender uh, equality. And uh, right, this was a speech of some 10 minutes. And right after that, uh, the Dharma Guru left uh, and together with his uh, wife. And uh, then you had the politicians uh, giving their speeches, um, similarly pointing out uh, the topicality of the Mahaguru. The first one was Subhash Nembang, the Subhash Nembang, the former speaker of the Constituent Assembly, and uh, also a Limbu from Panchtar himself, itself. Uh, and then came the Deputy uh, Prime Minister, um, and eventually there was a long line of other uh, speakers, politicians, and others of diminishing political import until the event slowly fizzled out and was followed by a Tea Party. So um, what can we make out of all uh, these uh, events, uh, half religious, half secular rituals? Well, the, uh, just want to stress uh, on the uh, ceremonial proceedings and their hierarchical structure. At the top, there is certainly here the Dharma Guru Atmananda. Then there are the politicians. First among them, um, there was the most senior person, the Limbu, and the highest off with the highest office, and then followed by the deputy prime minister. Now, I think the message is here clear. It corroborates, in a way, the claim of Atmananda to be the legitimate successor of Fagunanda. This is, I think, an important point because uh, there are competitors uh, or competition, competing lines. Uh, this is also clearly expressed in the stage set up, uh, as you have seen, the visual sign bores decorating days. The Dharma Guru was celebrated as a quasi divine figure with the big syllable Ot, not Om, it was the syllable Ot in the center, as you see here, uh, which was uh, prominent. So, it is, in a way, the like a shrine for the divine leadership uh, of uh, the divine Satyangma leadership, which was being claimed here. Uh, interestingly, the daily newspaper of FIDIM, uh, the FIDIM Today of November 12th, had a somewhat different order of precedence being reported here. The person mentioned first in line was the deputy prime minister, followed by Subhash Neymang, and then uh, the other politicians or several other politicians. Um, the presence and speech of Admananda in this article was only mentioned after that, 
Um, perhaps uh, this is just a common focus of journalists who focus on politicians mainly, but it may also indicate that not everyone uh, was happy with Atmananda's claim to this prime authority. Now, um, I think I should come to my conclusions now. Um, the commemorative celebrations in Fidim as a whole show, I think, in an extraordinary manner, uh, the importance which Pagunanda continues to have in contemporary East Nepal and beyond. The control, as we heard uh, also in, uh, in the UK, the control over this memory uh, is a contested issue and the way the rituals take place exhibit the fault lines of this struggle to some degree at least. The preceding day, um, to uh, sum up, the uh, day before the birthday is devoted to the Satyahangma ritual of fire offerings. And here it is above all the community of the Seva Sabas who are running the event. This is a rather inclusive religious performance, at least as it was celebrated in Fidim. Um, and I should say that this is, of course, some, what I'm talking here is, is something which is only taking place in the urban centers uh, in this particular manner. The situation is, of course, different if you go to the villages. Um, so on this first day, the uh, commemoration takes place through ritual speech, the recitation of the Mundum texts, which have come down on the devotees in the form of these books in the Sri Janga script. Now the Mahaguru is uh, celebrated through such ritual practices, emulating ritual action, which he is supposed to have established. So it is memory through mimesis and performance. The readings, the reading of books is a common ground and also enforces the canonization of a not yet completely canonized book tradition. It's still in process. On the major day, the main birthday, Kartik 25, the celebrations have a more secular aspect. Here, the celebrations are a large, a large scale public uh, event with a clear political or with clear political implications. The Mahaguru Bhagunanda is not only commemorated as founder of a religious revival, but above all, he is celebrated as a national figure, but all, uh, and also as a leader with a social message. Um, as, Ish, uh, as the Minister of Defense Ishwar Pokhrel uh, was uh, stressing in his speech, I, I quote to you from, from the uh, newspaper article, in today's situation, he said, Pagunanda's message of unity is of great importance. He is not only the guru of the Kirats, but of all Nepal. It is necessary to take the path shown by Pagunanda in order to establish mutual brotherhood and social goodwill. At the same time, the event on the FITIM sports ground is also an opportunity to underline the true legacy of the Mahaguru. There is no doubt that for the Dharma Guru, Atmananda, this is an ideal occasion to emphasize his claim to be the only rightful successor of Fagunanda. As a whole, the event is a win-win situation, you could say, for both the political leaders um, uh, who vie for the vote, after all, in these eastern districts, as well as for the religious leader uh, who is sometimes described uh, or also he describes himself as the spiritual leader of all Kirantis. Now, how would, a question which comes to my mind, how would the real historical Fagunanda have liked these developments if he would have attended? Of course, this is speculation, it is difficult to say, uh, but most eyewitnesses, uh, and there are few which I have met who have uh, encountered uh, the Mahaguru Fagunanda when he was still alive, uh, they describe him as a rather modest person. Um, one elder who remembered him from his childhood recounted the following. Uh, he said he, Fagunanda would calmly do his rituals, uh, recitations in the morning. Uh, then during the daytime, he would go around the village 
and uh, very strictly, emphatically, and authoritatively would give sermons and uh, exhort the people uh, to do the right things. And in the evening, he would casually chat, sit down, and mingle with the elders, um, just like any ordinary person in the village would do. Certainly, the Mahaguru was, a, was respected and sometimes even feared um, as a great charismatic leader in his lifetime. But I wonder what he would make of the contemporary cult and the many memorial statues in particular being worshipped today. I think he probably would not be very happy about this, uh, considering especially uh, his background in the Dosmani Sant uh, tradition, which, as I said, is a Nirguna Sampradaya. Um, and uh, that means a Sampradaya rejecting idolatry. He would not have condoned such a form of image worship, I think. What counted for him was the right mental and spiritual or moral attitude. And what exactly this is, I think this remains an issue of interpretation and contestation in the ongoing process of canonization, which we experience today. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I just show you here as the final slide, uh, this image which, ha which had been shown um, as a uh, major highlight of the events in Fidim. Uh, it's unfortunately not very clear, not very in focus, uh, but the center figure you see here is the uh, second image apparently, which we have of Fagunanda here, high up uh, in the, upper hill uh, in the upper mountains close to uh, Kanchenjunga. Thank you very much. Uh, this is all I wanted to say today. Right. Thank you, Martin, for great uh, ethnography. And you have shown that the, the rituals of Satyahangma, you know, how much they have been developed. Uh, would you like to remove your uh, slice? Yes, you want to keep it? I don't know. Okay. Mm. Um, great. Uh, we have got uh, a few questions already typed in the chat box, mm -hmm. but I encourage uh, all the participants also to think about the questions. I mean, if you think that you would like rather to uh, speak to the question, uh, I think we could do that as well. We have got uh, uh, about 45, 47 minutes to go. Mm -hmm. uh, um, this talk is also on live and Facebook. Uh, I've seen a question there. Let's start from the questions in the chat box here. Uh, and there is a question from... Oh, let me um, just see. Uh, yeah, Sanju Gurung, for example, uh, uh, and he, uh, he asked that they could elaborate a bit more why the Satyahangma originated in the first place. And what is your view on the scope of being extended view in Eastern part of Nepal? I think related to this, there is a question asked by uh, Martin Brooks. Uh, he said to add to Sanju's question, would you give a sense of penetration of Satyahangma in Kirat population, Limbu, Rai, etc., in Eastern Nepal, percentage of total view in uh, and in the UK, any insight of this amongst the ex Gorkha service Nepali community would be very helpful. Uh, if you'd like to answer those questions, then I think we'll pick more uh, from here. Yes, well, um, you mean uh, the question concerns about the uh, size of the community, right? Uh, well, it's, it's of course difficult to say uh, how many among the, uh, among the ordinary limbo, if you uh, allow this term, are or and not, not only, it's not only limbo, but there are also many among the Rai who are followers of Satyama, I should stress, but it's often seen uh, as a limbo uh, religion because uh, Pagunanda, he was a limbo, a limbo, he was a Lingden, and, he, and Atmananda also is from the same clan. Um, but uh, on the other hand, the movement as such, if you look at his disciples, uh, it was rather mixed and there were many uh, Rai as well. Um, and also later on, even after his death, uh, there was, for example, as I mentioned, one figure, Jyotinanda, who was a Rai, a Bantava Rai, um, as far as I know, who, who also 
preached in the same spirit. He never, he was born only in the 50s, but, um, but he was apparently um, inspired by the same ideas and teachings, and uh, he also had a certain following. So it was, uh, I mean, on the whole, of course, uh, one should say that it's, it's almost, it's always a smaller part of the community. I cannot give you any exact figures, uh, but uh, it's, it's, and it differs from village to village. There are some villages where almost uh, um, uh, all Limbu are followers, but uh, as far as I can see from my own experience, um, and uh, what I've heard, uh, often you have basically among the Limbu, you have three factions. There's uh, the uh, Satya Angma faction, and then there's uh, the other faction, and usually the, I think the larger one, which still continues uh, the original Mundum practices, including uh, blood sacrifice and so on. Uh, so there's a certain um, debate going on, even though most Limbu, even if they are not followers of the Satya Angma tradition themselves, uh, very much respect Bhagunanda. Um, but uh, still, it, as it implies a certain lifestyle and you should give up eating meat and uh, drinking alcohol, uh, it's not something uh, which has reached uh, really ac completely across uh, the communities. And there are also many villages where there are no Satyangma followers at all. So, I mean, to go back to the uh, earlier question about the origin of this movement, uh, I should perhaps explain, uh, and I haven't uh, gone into that here at all, uh, that this movement came up in the 1920s and especially in the 1930s um, at the time when, when there was a lot of uh, um, kind of uh, social tension um, in the east of Nepal. And uh, I see that Lionel Kaplan is also attending this lecture, so I, I don't have to explain in too much detail that this was a time when, when um, the Limbu were in, to a large degree indebted uh, uh, to the in immigrating high caste people and there was a big loss of their kipat land. There was this danger of losing the kipat rights and, uh, and uh, so it was during this time that the the leader of Hagunanda went around um, and tried to create unity. There was this big meeting in 1931 on the Silauti Danda, which is the place where eventually Hagunanda stayed and also he, di he died there. Uh, and his grave actually uh, still is, can be seen there in, Sila in Silauti Danda, which is a, a, a bridge between Ilam and Pidim. Um, and here there was a big political meeting when the 10 Limbu leaders, the Das Limbu, were uh, uh, coming together um, and uh, were uh, deciding under the uh, inspiration and under the leadership of Fagunanda to, to reform their religion. Because one of, one of the reasons, as Fagunanda saw it, why the Limbu were getting so much into trouble and losing their land was because they were uh, celebrating expensive rituals, expensive uh, marriage ceremonies, weddings, uh, and other rituals, ancestral rituals, uh, which brought them into debt, uh, uh, which brought them into the situation that they borrowed money. And then because of the mortgages, lost this land eventually to the immigrating high caste people. So in, in this particular setting, one has to explain that uh, this message of, uh, of kind of abstinence and modesty, you could say, uh, of uh, not celebrating expensive rituals, of not uh, uh, raising uh, too many uh, animals, uh, which is always uh, costly in a way. Um, this message was uh, was taken up by many, and and he promised more or less. He had this uh, vision in, in in his divinatory uh, uh, sessions. Also, he was talking about that this is uh, the way that the limbo uh, culture would be revived, and that the ancient greatness of uh, Kiranti civilization could be restored. That was the kind of narrative which is at the 
background of, of all this, one should explain that is that this idea that uh, the Kirati were subjugated uh, um, uh, as a as a powerful civilization, uh, and uh, and and eventually their power was destroyed by the income by the uh, military of the um, of the invading Shah uh, army. This this is a very important narrative, which is uh, still important today. That the idea that there was this ancient golden time, and this was destroyed uh, by the Shah uh, rulership, and uh, so it was important uh, to remind uh, the people ab about this heritage, which is associated with the script, with the uh, property of having. Uh, a script of one's own, which had uh, been lost and uh, was falling into oblivion. And he was therefore uh, promising old uh, golden times to come back. That's basically the message. Thank you. I think uh, you have answered the question Vishnu Gimire put about uh, the scope of the uh, religion outside Eastern Nepal that's been done. Uh, and there, there, there are a few questions here about uh, mm, the, some of the tensions maybe you know, within the community. You have mentioned different sects operating there. For example, here, uh, Naris Kapangi, Magar, uh, Balgopal, Sresta, uh, mm, and they're asking about, uh, okay, for Balgopal says, Martin, for your excellent presentation, thank you. And uh, during the, uh, uh, our research, we found kind of conflict existed between those who follow uh, Pedang, Pedangba, traditional Mundum and Satyahangma sects. It will be interesting for audience if you could explain why the critics are not happy about Satyahangma sect and even expelled from Kirat uh, Mangim temple, Sano Hatiban. Uh, Naris Kapangi, I think, is also asking the same line there. Satyahangma and he, uh, is being blamed by, you know, by some limbu, traditional limbu region being kind of Hinduite uh, sect. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and they support the, of the Nepal government when the state official religion was Hindu. What is your observation? Uh, I think these are the two questions that maybe you would like to shed more light on. Sabakar Adhikari had you know, asked about uh, uh, Palgunanda's view on uh, indigenous people. I think uh, you somehow responded on the context you know, that, that came out. Um, yes, uh, coming to Balgopal's uh, question, thank you very much uh, of bringing up this issue of the Kirad Manghim uh, temple in in, Hat, in Sano Hatiban, which uh, I, I shortly mentioned, it is of course a, a very important temple and a very unique temple um, uh, because it has uh, also the the kind of uh, pyramidal shrine uh, as uh, one of the shrines, but it also has shrines uh, for the of the Rai and the Sunvar and the Yaka. So it is a very uh, uh, interesting shrine because it has not only one um, form of divinity, but it has a kind of four different uh, styles uh, for the different sections of the Kiranti as a whole. Uh, so um, yes, uh, I also know that uh, he, that the Satyahangma tradition is not very welcome there, uh, but I think one has to distinguish again between between the Atmananda line on the one hand and uh, followers of Pagmananda, because um, I think um, that's important to understand that, and that's why I went into that uh, to some degree. I think for most Limbo, uh, respecting Pagmananda as a leading figure uh, is not an issue, and also those uh, who go to the uh, Sano Hadiban temple usually uh, uh, are respecting Pagunanda as a, as a kind of important figure, even though they may not themselves uh, uh, be followers, but they see, they see Atmananda um, at, and the line of Atmananda um, as, as a kind of um, 
yeah sectarian tradition which uh, which tries to monopolize uh, the the legacy of Fagunanda and and this is exactly the kind of split uh, I was trying to point out here uh, that not all those who who respect and and uh, also follow uh, uh, Fagunanda and and might see themselves as uh, and also see themselves as uh, Satyangma uh, in spirit are necessarily followers of, of Atmananda. Uh, even though uh, there is not really a kind of competing uh, guru, uh, as not so far as at least as, as I can see, uh, but um, at least this is not yet the case, uh, but, uh, but certainly uh, not everyone also in, in East Nepal and also in Fitin, as I indicated shortly, uh, was happy that Atmananda is presenting himself as the spiritual leader of all of all Kiranti, and this I think is exactly where the where the uh, yeah debates are starting, and uh, and I try to understand, and it's still work in process uh, to see. Um, how this comes out in the textual tradition. Uh, and that's why I'm trying to compare these different lines of tradition and, and see uh, how much one can really reconstruct uh, as what is authentic in the sense that uh, texts which are really close to what the uh, historical uh, Fagonanda has actually said. And for that, I think these, uh, these divination texts uh, seem to be quite interesting to be studied. Um, but this, as, as I said, is still research in the beginning and I can't uh, really come to concluding points here. Thank you, Martin. Uh, let me pick a question from David Gellner here. Uh, he is, uh, uh, we can also look at that. Creating this complex liturgical, uh, sorry, litug liturgical text in the Sirijanga script requires a large and collective effort. Do we know when and where they were created? And if we look at the content of them, are they closer to the oral mundum text or to some other model? And maybe you would like to link up mm -hmm. but in the Facebook here that... Uh, the, mm. well, let me just ask, answer this question by David. Okay. Um, about the text, uh, as I said, it's still work in the beginning, uh, but um, but it seems there are quite a few notes um, uh, existent, which which have been written down by these two major disciples, which were quite prolific, Patrinanda and uh, and Rana um, and and this is really what one has to look at. Uh, I think uh, what what I'm also interested in is to see how in, in which respect uh, the Josmani tradition has really affected uh, the kind of textual tradition. I mean, you find, of course, the, if you just look at the divinities being worshipped, uh, these are all limbu divinities. There's no, uh, I also saw that's a general question which comes up uh, in other uh, comments as well. The question in what respect is that really a Hinduized tradition? If you look at uh, some rituals, of course, you see the Trishul, you see the Hom uh, sacrifice. A lot of these things uh, seem to be entirely Hindu. And that's also one reason why many of the tr more traditional minded Limbu don't really follow these, uh, th this path. They see it as a kind of Hinduization, which uh, they reject. That's an important part, uh, but actually, um, yeah, it's it's not so clear cut uh, because uh, first of all, it seems uh, that uh, Pagunanda was actually using entirely the Limbu language, uh, even uh, in not only in the Mundum recitations, but also in in his sermons. As far as I can see, he was entirely even he was a widely traveled person. I mean, he had been in Europe, he had traveled all around. Uh, India, for example, when he was still a wandering sadhu. So he must have been quite fluent uh, uh, in Nepali and other uh, languages, I, I'm assuming. But he, the texts which we have in writing are mainly in, entirely in Limbu script. So he saw it definitely as a, um, as a, as a Limbu religion and nothing else. Thank you. I think just a quick uh, joiner here in Facebook uh, Live. Uh, 
by Santabir Singh Tuladar. He is asking that the, how many tangible and intangible heritages have you found? How many of them do you recommend as world heritage? I don't know, the question could be very broad and vague. Uh, uh, can you say again, please? Uh, it was just have you found specific. any tangible or intangible heritages that could be recommended to be listed in the world heritage sites? Uh, I, I mean, the person. Uh, well, the I mean, um, yeah, it's uh, still the the Mundum is a, a huge uh, intangible heritage, as as we know, um, and uh, now, of course, the Satyangma rituals have transformed this rich oral tradition, um, which is still very much alive all over Eastern Nepal, uh, into a written tradition. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting process one can observe here. Uh, but also if you listen to the rituals or see the rituals, I, I could have also shown uh, some video clips. You can see that also even people when they're reading and that's something you find also in other traditions, even reading uh, the text usually means that it's uh, not only read word by word, but it's often a recitation, it's an incantation. So it has also an oral quality. And sometimes uh, the books are just used for memory uh, props and, uh, and people actually still know, know the text also by heart. Uh, so it's also an oral tradition. And I wouldn't say that it's uh, that the Sandhya tradition is entirely a book tradition as they often present themselves. But if you look at the rituals and, there's, and the Seva Sabas also are, are often people who have a shamanic uh, background uh, and, and they certainly have also a lot of oral textual competences. So yes, certainly there's a strong Thank you. Uh, there. Thank you. I've also been, uh, I've, I've received suggestions that maybe, you know, I should also let people to speak themselves if they like, uh, which I had offered before. Uh, I think that's a good idea to make it more interactive. We've got uh, about uh, 10, 15 minutes to go, or maybe even 20 minutes to go. Uh, Melanie, if you, I've got a question here. Maybe do you like to put it uh, by yourself? Yes, see. Sorry, hello. Hello everyone. Um, yeah, thank you, Martin, for the for the for the talk. Sorry, I, I put it, I, I have two screens, so you yeah, here we are. Okay. It's fine, yeah. Good yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the, the question was more um, about this uh, this relation connection between Falgunanda and 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 the, the, the Pedangma that um, Balgopal has also uh, question discussed um, that was just if, if during this e event you you had you have heard about um, the old tradition of the of the lingu what they call the tuturi mundum uh, they make it mm. still a difference between this old mm. pedangma yeah. um, uh, ritual practices and the, in, in East Nepal, especially according to our colleague Prem Chetri's fieldwork in East Nepal, we have seen that they still divide between, they define uh, the, the, the Pedangma Mundum as oral Mundum and the Palgunanda and Satyangma tradition as, uh, as a written Mundum. Uh, I understand why you discuss this division. Yeah, it's how people perceive it, how, how, how far I have understood. And so I'm, I was uh, struck by the, the this idea of national integration of Palgunanda. And I was wondering if you heard any any debate or discussion about the, the, the Pedangma tradition and, and if we, we could think it's it just a, an idea whether uh, it was a way to, to integrate the Limbu more into the Nepal state and, and that would also, knowing the context also of, of claim of a Limbu one and, and, and the change in the name of province number one, if it was a way, a kind of statement, something to tell also to this old tradition, which could be seen as representing this more resisting part of the, of the Limbus. I don't know, it's just a more reflection than a question, mm -hmm. but. No, I, I think it's, Thank you for the question. Yes, I think it's an important point to, to look at this political dimension. And uh, yes, I should stress uh, again, perhaps that this 
these kind of celebrations, which I have uh, uh, discussed today, are in fact, uh, in particular, an urban phenomenon. Um, and uh, yeah, in, in, as in general, one could say that the Sapta Hangma movement uh, in general is something you find in particular in the urban contexts. Uh, you find it in, in, in Fidim, you find it uh, in, in Damak, for example, uh, in Biratnagar, maybe to some degree, but uh, yeah, in, in Daran in particular also. Uh, so it's in these small district capitals, but also in, in, in the Kathmandu Valley, as, uh, as I've shown in, in the Lubu temple. Even though it's not a very big community in Kathmandu, I was uh, actually surprised to see. It's really more, uh, more lively in in Larumba, of course, is the center. That's where uh, it, it's in, in Ilam district, uh, where uh, the major following of uh, Atmananda can be found. So it, it has a certain, um, uh, yeah, urban touch altogether. That's certainly true. And the situation is indeed different if you go to the villages where you also find, uh, as you know, the small uh, Mang hymns. Uh, but there, of course, the festival also looks different. Uh, Prem has, uh, Prem Chetri, our, 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 uh, our collaborator, has, has done some recordings there where he shows that also people there uh, do uh, celebrate the, the birthday celebrations but more in, in the religious manner, which I described, and, and not in the secular part, not having this kind of political dimension as uh, I described it for Fidim. So yes, I, I think there's certainly a, a, a social aspect to it that it's, it's a kind of middle-class phenomenon, you could say. Uh, and that's why it's attractive in particular uh, in, in this urban, Parts because of, I would say it's it, 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 it might also be a reason why it's uh, it's something which is uh, flourishing in the, in the UK in the diaspora in general because uh, of course anybody who is outside of the village context in in a foreign country uh, has certain difficulties celebrating the ancient Mundum rituals of the Fedangba because you can't just uh, sacrifice a pig or a chicken uh, without difficulties when you're in London or in, uh, in some other um, uh, Western country uh, and city. So it has, it is, it is, I think, uh, one of the reasons why, why the movement has somewhat been revived. As I said, it had already almost disappeared in the 60s, it seemed, uh, and then in the 70s, uh, and it's not, well, you could, say, you could answer, you could argue that it's mainly Atmananda who was behind uh, this revival, but I think uh, Atmananda on his own, uh, would not have been able to, to create such a large movement uh, without the necessary preconditions. And, and, and yeah, and it's also an economic issue. I mean, if, uh, if you go to La Rumba, um, uh, you see that there's a lot of money involved. Uh, uh, Atmananda has, has built a big ring road around the hill, which uh, he now occupies. And uh, there are a lot of constructions going on. And uh, I haven't really studied these economic aspects uh, so far, but uh, I recently discovered uh, a website um, where actually there was uh, a housing development program called Satya Hangma uh, Settlement or something in, in the area of Damak, where apparently a big stretch of land was bought uh, uh, to develop a kind of gated community for, for Satya Hangma uh, followers. So I think that's also an interesting development, which which shows the kind of economic and uh, sociological background of this movement. Thank you. I think let me take a few questions rather than the one by one. I think uh, maybe uh, I've got Kira Letija. Kira, do you like to speak or shall I read this question? Oh, uh, I can also speak. Yes, uh, what... go ahead. Hello. 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 Uh, yeah. Martin, if, if you just note that, I would like other people to also put questions before you answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. You mentioned this already a bit about animal sacrifice. I was curious about the implication of stopping sacrificing. And of course, you mentioned about the diaspora, but I understand that sacrifice is very important in Old Mundum. So uh, have you heard comments of uh, discussions about this? What, what are the implications to stop? 
uh, animal sacrifice also in the relation with the with the with the people who are receiving cat people entities who are receiving this sacrifice what does it mean quitting sacrifice you you, you see my question i'm interested in the, the, if there are any comments about that in the uh, yeah well uh, it's it's a certainly a, a big issue and uh, i think the 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 movement and this debate uh, of course is a very old one and and uh, i've already in my earlier research in the Rai area in the 1980s, I, I first came across uh, some some uh, households where I was told, "Oh, these these are jogis. Uh, that means uh, they are different." And and basically that meant uh, they are vegetarians. They don't drink, and uh, yeah, they were somehow uh, different. It, it, they were respected. They had different. Uh, they made different rituals, uh, but it was really a, a minority. It was maybe five percent or even less in the village. So it was. It was something which was there, but it was clearly nothing which uh, was uh, of any mainstream um, relevance. But I think it, the situation um, is is different in other areas and. Uh, for example, further south in, in, in places like uh, uh, Ravi in Panchtar, um, this is quite common. And actually, this is, was one of the reasons why I f uh, got interested in this topic in the first place is because my uh, friend Novel Kishor Rai comes from, from uh, Ravi, and he always told me uh, in, in Ravi, half the people, half the households, uh, they are. Uh, followers of Josmani, it's it's all um, uh, Rai people, uh, mainly Rai and uh, also Limbu, but there are no people in the whole village uh, who are uh, non-vegetarians, either they are Josmani, followers of the Josmani uh, fund, or they are followers of, uh, of Fagunanda, Satyangma. And so the whole village, you wouldn't find a chicken uh, going through the uh, uh, through the paths of the of the village, uh, no no pigs, no chicken, nothing. Uh, so it it was something which already uh, well 60, 70 years ago apparently was something you could find in these villages in East Nepal in some areas. But in other areas, if you go then further north or up to Tiratum or uh, other areas. Um, Certainly, um, there are equally, equally there are um, there are there are uh, villages where you don't find any satyangma or, or other jogis, whatever you want to call them, but where everybody still follows the the fidangma mundum. And I, I really should stress that this is probably still uh, the large majority of of villages in contemporary East Nepal where you still have the traditional mundum very much alive. So it is it is a movement which has come in slowly and marginally almost, and it has become stronger over the years, but it's still, it's a movement which is still not uh, pervasive, certainly. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think in the audience, I don't know whether anybody would want to ask in Nepali. I they didn't give the option before maybe you know uh, i should give for at least one or two questions yadi kasaile nepali ma prashna sodhna chahanu huncha bhane e pani sodhna saknu huncha bolnu sani hami translation garna sakinchha dia aashya pare bhane yadi dherai time ta chaina so thank you uh, the next question is from steph steph would like to ask himself thank you stephanie mm -hmm. Well, maybe I think uh, I don't know whether she can hear me. Okay, let me read that question so that I think we save time. Thank you, Martin. Considering the project's cross border theme and on the background of the half religious, half political, political sphere, is it possible to map the political onto the religious landscape? Mm. You mean the, uh, what do you mean with political landscape? Uh, I'm not sure whether this is meant in a more restricted sense uh, in, in terms of party politics or 
Um, I mean, as I said already, it's it has uh, also in other questions it was raised whether this is something, um, yeah, going into um, the direction of a kind of national uh, unification, and uh, I mean that's also a political aspect in terms, which is an issue. Um, I mean, in terms of ethnic politics, uh, which brings in the question in, in, in what respect is there a kind of Kiranti unity? As you know, this is a, a big issue, especially in Eastern Nepal and also, especially also in, in the context of uh, the larger uh, cross border uh, uh, relationships with uh, Limbus and, and Kirantis in Sikkim and Darjeeling. The question is there something like a Kiranti unity, um, which uh, includes both the, the Limbu as well as, as uh, the, the uh, Sunwa, Yaka, and Rai? Is that the question, or, or are you talking more about the party politics, uh, which of course is another issue which I also shortly uh, addressed? In uh, because, uh, yes, these, um, as you know, the workings of politics in Nepal, um, it's always uh, important for the politicians when they stand for vote um, that they go into these areas. Um, and uh, and get uh, kind of um, yeah kind of vote bank uh, uh, behind them and that's also something where, where it was also said often that Atmananda in a way controls uh, so and uh, so uh, many thousand votes because once you have uh, as a politician standing for election once you have Atmananda behind you uh, then you can more or less uh, count the whole uh, district for yourself so uh, that's of course also an aspect uh, which does not always uh, yeah, uh, yeah go well with with uh, others uh, who who would like to see a separation of politics uh, and religion and don't so much like this kind of mixing, mixing of these two spheres. I'm not sure whether I answered the question, but uh, there are various issues coming in here. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what I was asking, but it's banging so loud here. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Uh, I have, I think now, just got uh, three questions left and they, I didn't think we have got more time after that. Uh, I would like uh, Kumud Ranaji to ask a question. Uh, please try to keep it short. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So would you be able to say anything about the gender presentation of Falgunanda as it is depicted in various images and sculptures? I was quite intrigued by how um, his image shifts in different pictures in terms of what he wears, his physique, and the red necklace disappears at one point. Yeah, thank you for this question. This is actually a very important issue, which I just noticed during my last uh, trip in 2018. Uh, because actually, uh, uh, it never occurred to me that the dress, which uh, you see in these images and is reproduced, is actually a female dress. He's, he's uh, wearing uh, this female um, um, head, uh, this female um, mala kind of uh, traditional um, ornament, and uh, and. In fact, it's it's not a coincidence. People pointed this out to me that he he actually wore a female dress also, uh, and he was seen in a way as a kind of uh, you could almost seen as a as a kind of bisexual being. So uh, I mean, he also the way he was described, he had apparently long hair, um, and he, this especially this uh, this ornament uh, is a very is, is something never. Uh, a, a male limbo would wear like this. And it's, it's something which I never noticed before. Um, so people said, yes, he was a kind of unique figure in that respect also. That's why he, he, he was always described as something, uh, as a person who was, uh, was very impressive. That's why I said charismatic uh, in the classic sense. He, he was always, uh, yeah, encountered with awe. People where little ch children sit uh, were frightened, they were running away from him on, 
even when he didn't say anything and he could speak very strictly on the one hand, but he could also be very calm, be very modest. So I think this is perhaps part of the, the message. And as you also saw in the pictures um, in the sports ground, uh, you, you had uh, perhaps seen that uh, women dressed in white and the males were on separate sides. I mean, usually that's not uh, really a segregation, but it, it shows that actually the following uh, is to a very good degree. I mean, at least 50%, if not more of followers are female. So I think, uh, yeah, gender uh, is certainly a very important issue of, to understand this movement. I haven't really, uh, yeah, followed too closely into that, uh, but uh, I think that's an important aspect to, to look at, certainly. Thank you for pointing this out. Okay, thank you. I think Sapanalji wanted to ask, but uh, the question has been asked by Kumudzi, so there's a coincidence, so she doesn't need to ask. Uh, I think uh, I have a question here before from, just let me check. Did uh, a question. I think it, maybe you have already addressed this somehow. Nice learning about Kirat civilization. Have you found any connections of it with other ethnic communities? I'm Maga. Would like to learn much more about it. Thank you. That's his question. Well, thank you for this question. Yes, that's an interesting point as well. I, uh, I mentioned uh, La Cantapa, and uh, as you probably know, uh, there is a certain uh, bridge there because uh, also La Cantapa has been, uh, apparently it is said at least, uh, he, that he also was uh, a Josmani or initiated into the Josmani uh, tradition. So it seems uh, that actually, um, yeah, it's something which not only happened among uh, the Kiranti in East Nepal, but also uh, similar processes uh, can be observed also in other parts of Nepal. And the Josmani uh, movement actually started from the West and moved, it came apparently from Garhwal actually, even outside Nepal, um, but uh, was then brought by, uh, uh, by one of the earlier gurus um, Shashidar, especially, and then Dil, and, and then um, Gyandil Das uh, to the further west. And the Josmani movement has uh, also still uh, followers in, in Sikkim and in Darjeeling. And uh, according to Janaglal Sharma's book, uh, there are also communities in Bhutan and Assam and even in Nagaland. Uh, so it's also something which uh, hasn't really been studied uh, closely. So it's a, it's, it seems to be a very strong movement uh, which was taking place in the 19th and uh, eventually 20th century. And uh, so it goes back quite some time. Um, and yes, has apparently maybe also influenced other communities. I mean, Novel Kishore Rai um, has written a, a study together with Netramani Rai, uh, which has been published by the Nepal Academy on the Josmani, a very important book, which I uh, should recommend anyone interested in this movement because the Josmani movement has almost disappeared also from in Nepal, but it has been very influential. Um, and, uh, and there are still traces left, uh, as, as I said, and this book looks at these uh, remaining traditions, which are found, uh, for example, in, in Sikkim. So I think there's, these are important historical developments to understand uh, how also the ethnic movements uh, have actually come about because they had a, a prehistory. It's, it's not that uh, ethnic politics only or ethnic movements only started uh, after 1990. Uh, it has a certain prehistory. And perhaps this also brings me to the question uh, which I just read uh, uh, sent by Lionel Kaplan, where he asks uh, why this emergence of temples and books, uh, this kind of new religion has, has appeared fairly late. And I think it's not so late. It has, it has uh, gained a certain momentum um, 
in, in the last three decades it, because it has become this kind of mainstream uh, uh, or a middle class uh, kind of movement. Uh, but the movement uh, has its predecessors um, and this goes back to, uh, to the 19th century. And, and uh, I think for that, to understand, you have to look at the Josmanis who st started as a Bhakti tradition, mainly uh, uh, headed by gurus from the high caste, but, but which then shifted through in the course of the 19th century. Uh, apparently, it, it opened up and more and more uh, uh, disciples joined in from, from Magar community, from Rai community, from Limbu communities and others. So I think that's uh, why it's interesting to look at this tradition. Thank you. I think with that uh, note, uh, we should uh, end the question and answer session. Uh, as we promised that we wanted to finish by three, I think we have made full use of the time and it was a Excellent uh, presentation, uh, the so rich data, uh, ethnography, and uh, you know pictures, uh, and uh, it was uh, the extremely we are, we are extremely grateful to have you to our twentieth anniversary, a, a, a of the BNAC, a, the, uh, the organization which I think will grow from strength to strength in the coming years with the uh, new researchers and uh, academics also joining to us. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants uh, for your patience and also uh, for asking wonderful questions. Uh, you made our program extremely valuable and uh, your contribution is much appreciated. I would like to take a name uh, to thank, uh, especially for this uh, 20, 20th anniversary program. I think the Samita Strategy kindly uh, designed our logo. So I must mention his name. Uh, I also already mentioned Stephanie for taking extra uh, efforts in making sure that our, our prize winners get their prizes, which they did. Uh, and it's uh, wonderful to have uh, uh, all of them today. I must apologize that the I think we couldn't sign get in a couple of or maybe a few uh, friends today due to the some technicality I don't know is it Zoom's fault or my fault but I Zoom couldn't be wrong uh, I'm sorry but we have put all the programs live we have recorded uh, uh, these proceedings so we'll put them in our Facebook and uh, YouTube channels later so so the people who are interested to look at them can access them. Uh, uh, we have uh, normally, uh, you know, we, we, we normally ask our speakers to try to prepare a paper and publish in EBSR, which Martin, I think I don't need to emphasize to you, you are both associated to EBSR and uh, uh, to the lecture. Uh, I would like to thank everyone and my colleagues at the BNAC uh, uh, and uh, especially the ambassador, uh, His Excellency uh, Durga Bahadur Subedi, our founding chair, Suri Subedi, for my excellent remarks. And I wish you all the best and please stay safe and strong in this challenging time. See you again. Thank you. Well, let me thank you all again uh, also for these interesting questions. I found it very helpful also for my further uh, inquiries. So, and uh, well, thank you for this great opportunity to speak here. Thank you very much. And yes. Have a nice day. <laughs>